Hey, it's me, Destin. This is a very raw video here on Smarter Every Day 2 about me learning about total solar eclipses. I actively did not learn about them until I went to meet Dr. Gordon Telepin in this conference room. So this is just me struggling through the concepts and stuff like that. So I hope you enjoy this type of thing. We get pretty deep at times, in over my head for sure. I hope you enjoy it. Um, please consider subscribing to this. This is the second channel, Smarter Every Day 2. But uh, there's a couple of times where we misspeak. Like, I'm not going to go in and try to edit all that out. I say some things that are wrong. I think there's once I know of where he misspeaks. I'm not going to go find that. Just give us the benefit of the doubt. These are just two guys talking. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you get something out of it. But if you're looking for like a surface level understanding of, of solar eclipses, this is not where you want to start. You want to go somewhere else because this is pretty raw and it gets pretty deep. I hope you enjoy it. So ready for my private lesson? I've got a good show for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we can, you're saying we could go up to, we could go up to this, this church parking lot in, in Tennessee and we could, we could take the app in our hand and we could see what the timing would be during totality. Well, you can do that anywhere along the path. Okay. What is really interesting about this, and I've got to, I have to show you the map, is you can walk across the southern edge of the path and geolocation in smartphones is so good now that it's accurate to within like 20 feet. It can tell you when you're in the path or out of the path. You can be standing 30 feet away from me out of the path and I can be standing in the southern edge of the path. But we can use that to tell not only where you're at, but when C1, C2, C3, C4 are going to happen. Automatically. Down to what accuracy, temporarily? A tenth of a second. No way. Absolutely. Okay. And so your app will say 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, totality. Yeah, correct. Or C2. C, yeah, yes, exactly. No way. It, it marks the, it has a tone at the exact time of C1, the exact time of T, C2. C3 and C4. But how does it tell you that it's about to happen? Because that's what's important. Because it counts down to it. Oh, it does? Audibly, yeah. I, I, I have the only app out there that talks to you so you don't have to w look at a watch. It gets really dark right at totality. And your eyes are not dark adapted. So when, when C2 hits, you can't even see your camera settings. Okay. You, you know what I mean? It takes you 15 or 20 seconds just to be able to see again. And it's getting dark up to that point, too. So it's nice not to have to look at a clock to have the, the app talk to you. And the reason you've, you've spent so much time making this audible timer is because you've seen several eclipses before and that's something you wish you had. Absolutely. When I was in Africa in 2001, my wife and I practiced like crazy for that eclipse, our, our photography plan going into C2. The event is so overwhelming, you're so inspired by the changes in lighting and the crowd getting excited and the crickets going wild because it's getting dark. You lose your focus. The crickets wake up? Absolutely. Animals think it, it, it's getting nighttime. Uh -huh. So they start to go crazy in the middle of the day. It's the most amazing thing. That's neat. It is neat. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Yeah, let's get a plan. What are we going to go through here? This is um, just a basic talk on basic eclipse astronomy. Okay. So here's the path. So, so just to, just to kind of give me an idea, you're about to go through all this eclipse data with me, and you're going to tell me everything I need to know to watch this eclipse, and I'm going to try to boil that down and put it in a video on the internet. That's correct. Okay, but I'm going to hit the highlights, and then we're going to figure out how to prepare people for this eclipse. And to inspire them not to miss it. This eclipse is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime thing for a lot of people. People are not going to travel all over the world to go to eclipses like I did. It's a wonderful thing to have an eclipse in your country that you can drive to. And when I show you the world maps of the eclipses that have happened over the past 20 years and are going to happen over the next 20 years, you'll understand how difficult it is to get to a total solar eclipse of the sun. And it's not just about getting to totality. It's also about once you're there, knowing what to look for because if you just see it, you know, with your, you know, with your goggles or whatever, you know, you're going to get to see it. But if you see it in a way where you get to know exactly what happens along the way, it's a totally different event, right? Absolutely. And you see, the entire country will have a partial eclipse where there will not be complete totality and you'll have to use glasses through the whole thing. But if you can get into the band of totality, you can take your glasses off and actually see the beautiful eclipse sun in the sky, naked eye, 
and it's a it's a wonderful event. Okay. So again, the thing about an eclipse is being in the umbra. So the sun makes a shadow. The penumbra is the outside, lighter part of the shadow, and the umbra is the deep part of the shadow. Okay, so the umbral shadow is like you're not getting the you know all of the, the light. Is some of the light diffusing around the object? Is that what's happening? So like if you're in my umbral shadow, the light is kind of what's happening there. It's not just the shadow, but you're getting light glancing around. No, you're in the shadow. You're in the deepest part of the shadow. If you're in the penumbra, you're, you're seeing a partial eclipse. You have to be in the umbra to see the total eclipse. So that's the deep part of the shadow. Now, the shadow in the United States, because of the duration of the eclipse, the widest part at greatest eclipse in Kentucky will be about 71 miles in diameter. So you'll be standing in the center of a 71 mile diameter shadow. But the beautiful thing about it is because the sun is illuminating the entire 360 degree perimeter, it looks like you have a 360 degree sunset all the way around you. Gotcha. Oh, wow. Really? Absolutely. It looks like a sunset all the way around you. So not only do you want to get somewhere that you can see the sun, you want to be able to see the horizon as well. That's one of the points of trying to choose an observing position is trying to be in a flat area with an unobstructed horizon. So if like can. Kansas would be the best. It would be beautiful, yes. Wow. And some of the places I've picked are better than others. Really? Yeah. Smart. Okay. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Now, so a solar eclipse doesn't occur at every... Uh, every new moon in the month because the moon is pitched to the Earth's orbit at five degrees. So it has to be a perfect month for it to happen. So let's look at months where it didn't happen. This is July, the month before the eclipse. The new moon is on the 23rd. But in, see, in July, the moon is going to miss the sun low. So it's up there. You don't know it's up there because the sun's so bright, but you're not going to get an eclipse. In September, the month after the eclipse, the new moon's up there on the 20th, but in September, the moon misses it high. So you're out there in the afternoon, you see the sun, the moon's up there, but you're not gonna have an eclipse. But in August, the new moon's on the 21st, and it's directly lining up. So bingo, the moon is right next to the sun, and it's going to obscure it. And how often does this happen? You. About twice a year. There's, there's things called eclipse seasons, which is kind of right. in the winter and kind of in the spring, uh, in the summer. And it's when that five degree pitch is matching the orbit of the Earth, which is called the node. Got so it. eclipses can only occur at the node, and it doesn't happen every time. But there's about, there's between two and four eclipses a year, but they're not all total. Okay, got it. So then this is what happens right here. First contact, or C1, is where the moon is approaching the sun, and it's going to be approaching, moving from east to west, and it just kisses the surface of the sun. Okay. Then all of the partial phases happen as the moon continues to move over the sun. Then, when the moon completely obscures the sun, that's second contact, or C2. So that's when the moon kisses the far side of the sun. No. When when the moon completely obscures the sun. Okay, so, so say that one more time. So C1 is when the moon first touches the just sun. touches the sun. C2, C2 is when you have complete obscuring of the sun. You go into totality. And how long is the time difference between C1 and C2? It can vary. It can vary. In our eclipse, it's about an hour and 35 minutes, but it also varies across the country. An hour and 35 minutes? the partial minutes. phases, yes. Wow. But I mean, it's really variable. It's different in Oregon than it is in Hopkinsville at Greatest Eclipse. So C2 is when totality starts. Then the moon keeps on moving across the sun. And when the sun pops out on the back side, that's the end of totality, and that's C3. So the sweet spot is the time between C2 and C3. That's correct. That's totality. Okay. And for max eclipse in Hopkinsville, it's 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Okay. Then you go through all the partial phases on the other side when the moon's moving off the sun. And then at C4 is when the moon just leaves the surface of the sun again. That's when the party's over. Yes. Okay, so to say it succinctly, so there's four main events that happen. 
There are four contact times. Okay. First contact is when the moon is approaching the sun and it first touches the, the disk of the sun. Second contact is when totality begins. The moon has completely obscured the sun and you can take your solar glasses off and enjoy it with your eyes. Third contact is when the moon has just moved off the sun and the glare of the sun will now be visible again on the, on the uh, eastern side of the moon. And then uh, fourth contact is when the moon has completely moved off of the disk of the sun and the, the complete sequence of the eclipse is over. So to be clear, people are going to have to use glasses between C1 and C2. And C3 and C4. And C3 and C4. But Correct. C2 to C3, that's the that's awesome totality. spot. Exactly. Okay. If you're in the path of totality. Okay. You've got to be in the path. You have to physically go to that location. Exactly. And so at totality, it's a wide band. And so if you're on the outer edge of totality, the time between C2 and C3 could be really, really short, like seconds. Exactly. But if you get on into the path, the totality plane, the closer you get to the center, the more you can stretch the time between C2 That's and exactly C3. Right. To get the maximum duration of totality, you want to be on the center line because that's the chord of the circle. Okay, so these times, C2, C3, they change based on where you physically are in the totality Correct. plane, which is why you've spent, you know, a lot of time and effort on your personal project, which is this app that you made. Correct. To, yeah, and so and, and the, the purpose of the app is to figure out where C2 and C3 and C1 and C4 even are based on where you are physically. Correct. It, it will calculate those times, and then it will automatically, audibly count down to those times so you know exactly when it's happening. So you've, you've invested a lot of time and personal money and stuff in this app that's going to be good for one day. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? It's my hobby and my passion. Uh, total eclipses are an awesome event, and I want everybody in the country to try to get to the path. Really? Yes. And, and but I want like the path com to be completely congested with people. What happens the day after the eclipse? I mean, you spend all this time making this eclipse timer. What happens the day after the event to this you know pet project of yours? I start to load the Basilian em, uh, elements, which are the numbers that go into the calculation for the eclipse that will hit the coast of Chile in 2019. Really? Yes. Wow. That's awesome. What are you going to do? Like, people are going to take pictures of this from all over the world, right? Right. Are, are people going to, like, send you pictures or something like that? No, I'm not interested in compiling anybody's photography. I mean... Um, you just want to get people there. And, and I... You know, my other interest is teaching people how to photograph this eclipse. There is no way to practice for an eclipse. The dynamic range of the lighting, the exhilaration of the event, all throw you off as a photographer. So you have to learn from other people's experiences on how to photograph an eclipse, how to set up your gear, how to choose shutter times, what focal lengths are appropriate. So I've been spending a lot of time online on the astronomy blogs posting pieces of my lecture about how to photograph eclipses. That's, okay, so this is a really unique thing then because there's years between each eclipse. Correct. You can't practice. Correct. You have to get it right. Correct. And the only way you can get it right is to, to contact somebody who's a complete What's the word you would use? A fanatic? <laughs> would you use the word I fanatic? I would say fanatic, yes. Yeah. Okay, got it. I understand what we're doing here. Thanks. It's amazing. Let me tell you something. So here it is again. So there's another way you don't get an eclipse, even if you are perfectly lined up. If the moon is too far from the Earth, the umbra doesn't reach the Earth. And in that case, you get what's called an annular eclipse. The moon obscures the sun, but there's still a rim of photosphere all the way around the moon. So in that case, you still have to keep your glasses on through the whole thing. Wait, hold on, what? You can have, you can have a, 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 the moon get between you and the sun, but the sun is still on the outside? That's correct. I, well, I'm going to show you the next slide. Well, this slide. Yes, because sometimes, since the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit are both elliptical, there are some nodes where the sun will be perfectly lined up, but you don't get a total eclipse because the moon is so far away 
or the sun is so close to the earth. So the moon and the, the, the sun and the sky are not big enough of the moon to obscure the sun. It's called a steradian, right? The solid angle. I, I don't know that term. I think it's called a steradian. Well, here's the thing. So the little bit of math or or the little bit of luck or divine um, development of our solar system. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's also 400 times further away. So that solid angle makes it basically a similar triangle. Exactly. What we call it is the angular diameter in, in the sky, so or, or the angular degrees that it takes up in the sky. The sun is about 0.52 of a degree in the sky. And, and there are some times when the moon is going to be just a little bit bigger than that, so it can obscure the sun. But when it's not bigger than that, you get an annular eclipse where the moon goes over the sun, but it's not bigger, big enough to obscure it completely, so there's a rim of sun all the way around the moon because the angular diameters are such that the sun is bigger than the moon at that particular one. So this is extra sweet because the moon is bigger than the sun in this particular Super eclipse. Extra sweet. Super extra sweet. Super extra sweet <laughs> eclipse. <laughs> On eclipse day, we'll be about 94 million miles away from the Earth. The moon on eclipse day will be about 277,000 miles from the Earth. It's going to cast a shadow on the Earth that is going to be between 40 and 70 miles wide. So people have to get into a little dot of a shadow that basically started because of something lining up 94 million miles away. Yep. That's hard to that's hard to wrap your brain around, but I get it. It's crazy. So this is why it works. So we've got two elliptical orbits. The sun, the earth around the sun and the moon around the earth. What you want is to have the moon close to the earth so its angular diameter in the sky is bigger. And you want the sun to be as far away from the earth in the orbit so its angular diameter is smaller. So aphelion for the sun and perigee for the moon. So for you to have a really long dura duration eclipse, you've got to get the sun to be the smallest di angular diameter you can. You got to get the moon to be the biggest angular diameter you can. You have to get right. You have to get in the path right at the center line, and you have to get to the point of calculated maximum duration versus greatest eclipse. Those those are subtle, but basically that's what it is. So if everything was perfect, the theoretical maximum duration of eclipse can be just over seven minutes and thirty seconds. That's as long as it can ever be when everything is perfect. And ours is going to be 240, so that's not bad. So the, the longest duration eclipse that could ever happen is going to happen on July 16th, 2186? That's correct. Are you, uh, are you a little irritated that you won't be alive then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very irritated. Actually, I'm irritated I missed this one. July 11th, 1991 was 653. That's probably the longest one that's ever going to be in our lifetimes, you know, watching this video, and I missed it. Why'd you miss it? It was in Mexico, and I was in my second year of my plastic surgery residency, and I, I just couldn't take off. It was in July, starting my second year. Did of, you care at that point? Absolutely cared. Yeah, I knew about it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, when was your first eclipse? The, uh, my first eclipse was 2001. Really? The one that you got to? The and one you... I finally got to. Yeah. What was and that like? Do you have video of it? I do, yeah. We're yeah. Gonna, we're going to play it. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So here it is again. So people have to get here. Now, you're going to love this. So this is some just facts about our eclipse. So the shadow is swinging through space because there's always a shadow of the moon and it's whipping through space all the time. But every once in a while the earth gets in the way. So it's going to land in the Pacific Ocean and the velocity of the shadow when it lands is 9,500 miles per hour. Yeah. It's whipping across. Now, so the entire United States is going to see partials. I mean, this is 100%. And as you get certain degrees away, you get to be 90%, 80%, 70%. You know, it just gets more and more partial. Twelve states have the center line actually in it. 
And there's two other states that have a little bit of the umbra. So 14 states are actually touched by the umbra. The total length of the shadow ocean to ocean is 8,600 miles. It's only going to be on Earth for 3 hours and 13 minutes. The average speed across the United States is 1,700 miles an hour. It hits the coast of Oregon at 2,400 miles an hour. At max eclipse, when it slows down, kind of like the peak of a roller coaster, is 1,448 miles per hour. And then it leaves South Carolina at 1,400 again. Uh, the narrowest parts of the path are when it hits the oceans at about 35 miles wide. The maximum uh, width is about uh, greatest eclipse at 71 miles, an hour, um, 71 miles wide. This total surface area of shadow is about 0.3% of the Earth's surface. And on average, any spot on the Earth would see an eclipse about once every 375 years. So if you went out in your backyard and you stood there, there's a chance in 375 years you'd have an eclipse cross over your head. Hmm. So do you recommend picking like beforehand? Make the decision if you're going to take pictures or if you're going to just watch it with your eye. No, I think people can do both. I think if you prepare for both, you can get your photography over with very quickly. There's nothing, there, you're not going to have any more interesting picture than your own physical picture of this eclipse. There'll be plenty of beautiful you know, professional pictures on the internet, and that's fine. But having your own to show your family and your friends that you took this picture, even if it's not great, is still worthwhile. It's also like a, it's also like a scientific challenge, right? Oh, it is. It's, it's a, it's a, the pressure is unbelievable. You got one shot at it. So it's like, it's like figuring out all the math in the sky figuring out the location, all that, and then also understanding enough about photography to actually be able to take a photo while you're doing something that's very unnerving. When you don't have a second chance and you can't practice in advance. Yeah, it's kind of like a personal test. It is. It's a, it's a huge challenge. It's, is is it's that hard. why you like it so much? I think so. Because you're you're a very meticulous person. Like You, you cut on people's bodies and right. it has to be right the first time. Exactly. And so is, this, is that kind of the thing that drives you, you think? This is even more pressure than that, really. Really? Yes. Wow. That's cool. Okay. Cool. So that's why in 2001, after that first eclipse, I said somebody has to develop a dedicated timer for eclipses. Okay. Somebody needs to do it. There's got to be a way to time this. So basically, you need a five-event timer. You have to be able to pre-program your contact times. So C1, C2, C3, and C4, and also have a mark of mid-max eclipse because you're overwhelmed during the eclipse and the time gets away from you very quickly. A minute and 40 seconds is fast. In Africa, I think our eclipse was um, three minutes and 35 seconds. No, um, uh, two minutes and 40 seconds in Hopkinsville. In Africa, we had three minutes and 35 seconds and still went fast. So another important mark is to know when it's about halfway over. Make sure you get done with your photography and enjoy the eclipse with your eyes. So in 2001, I programmed, I, I paid a programmer to program the first eclipse talking timer, uh, which we used in our 2002 eclipse. It ran on Windows 98 for I heard laptop. It in the background. Yeah, on the, on the second one, you're going to hear it. And then it ran on Compact PC, the Windows Compact PC. And I, this is from 2002, and I still have one that works. Wow. So you, so you made this back then to try That's to figure right. out. So there's the original talking timer You from 2002. You made the, okay, I don't know what's more impressive, that you made this in 2002 or that you have one of these things that still works. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's fantastic. Huh. Wow. So why don't you just update your, uh, the Compaq and, and have everybody use one of them? Well, because mobile phones are <laughs> so much more powerful, and we were able to do um, so much more you know, with it. Gotcha. So, so here's the problem. This is why I want everybody to get to this eclipse. These are eclipses, both annular and total, that happen since, are going to happen or happen since 2001 to 2020. And you see they're all over the place. The red ones are the annulos. They're not as much fun to get to. And the blue ones are the totals. But they're really difficult to get to. Look at the ones that are in the ocean, the ones that are down in Antarctica, up north, across 
Is Russia. The wider the band, the longer it lasts. That's exactly right. That has that's a relative indication of the duration. Wow. So you see, here's ours right across the United States. It's so easy to get to. We can't miss it. The ones that I've been to is this one right here that went across Africa, this one right here that went across Africa, and this one right here that went across Africa and crossed the Mediterranean Sea, and I saw that one on a cruise in the Mediterranean Sea. This might be the most important slide here. It's hugely difficult to get to these, and it's really expensive. So to be able to drive to one in the United States is something that people really have to consider. Wow. Okay. And here's the next set of years. So this is 21 through 40. And again, they're all over the place. But look at this. 2024, the United States gets another one. So we are really lucky. So you're saying, you're saying if I miss this one, I mess this one up. Right. I, I have another chance in 2024. That's correct. But that's it. That's yeah. if I live that long. That's correct. Wow. Yeah. So this, is, this is, might be a once-in-a-lifetime event. That's exactly right. And you never know about weather, right? So the 2024 one is in April. And so, you know, again, like the summer weather in, in the United States in the southeast, it's thunderstorms, clouds, rain. This is a daytime event, and you have to have clear weather. So in April in 2024, a lot of the northeastern part of this country is going to have shaky weather. So I'll probably go down to Texas for this one. So... That's why I'm going to Wyoming for this one. Correct. You think that's a good move? Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. That makes me feel better. Yeah. So now this is, I'm a geek for eclipses. This is one of the most important parts about enjoying a total eclipse that people don't get a chance to learn about. And this is the other important thing about my app. So one of my NASA contacts, Mitzi, I was, in, I was in Zambia in 2001. She was there too. We were at two different places. But this is a data logger of the temperature. And you can see the temperature drop to totality and then increase back up. She lent me that data logger and I brought it to Zimbabwe in 2002 and, and I did it again. So in my app, I have announcements that announce for people to observe for the changes in ambient temperature at 45 minutes, 30, and 15 before C2. It's all programmed in, so whatever the C2 time is, it calculates backwards, right? At 10 minutes, there's an announcement to look for the ambient lighting changes. At eight minutes, there's an announcement to look for changes in animal behavior, you know, crickets, chickens going to roost, stuff like that. Three minutes is an announcement for shadow bands. Then in mid-eclipse, it announces to remind you to look at the horizon, to spin around and look at the 360-degree horizon. And 30 seconds after C3, it, it reminds you to observe for shadow bands again. This is really important, and, and people miss this because they don't have enough chance to study what happens in an eclipse. The, it's called the partial phase phenomena, and, it, and it's a wonderful part of an eclipse. Okay, so let me so let me get this right. So what we want to observe during the eclipse, okay? This is between C2 and 3 C say let me say it again. So between C2 and C3, that's the magic part, right? That's the totality. That's what everybody that's the big event. That's what everybody really is going for. What I'm telling people to do is not miss the partial phase phenomena which are the other things that happen before totality, between C1 and between C3, where the sun is continually being obscured by the moon, and your surroundings change. The temperature changes, the lighting changes, the animals get confused because they think nighttime is falling, and if you're really lucky, you'll get to see shadow bands. Shadow bands don't have it happen at every eclipse and they don't happen at every observing area. What, what are shadow bands? Shadow bands are an effect where the light, as it's going through the atmosphere, going through warmer and cooler cells in the atmosphere, and some NASA scientists think it's actually the warmer and cooler interface between the umbra and the penumbra, it bends the light and causes motions of serpentine shadows across the ground 
that look like thousands of snakes crawling in unison Shut up. in parallel this is going away this from is you no and to the side it's unbelievable i saw him in 2002 no absolutely is, you're saying you're saying it's gonna it might look like snakes are crawling on the ground very faint because they're little gray shadows and the way i perceive them is picture thousands of parallel snakes going like this going away from you and to one of the sides, depending on if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, oh, Northern Hemisphere. Is it interference? Is it interference? Like, is it, is it additive? Is it additive and destructive interference? I don't know. It, okay, we had to figure this out. So there's, I have a hard time believing this. You're saying shadow bands, it looks like shadows of snakes are on the ground. When does that happen? It happens when the sun is the final slit, about 60 seconds before totality and about 60 seconds after. It's kind of like now you don't have a globe of the sun casting many directions of light on the earth. You have a slit of the sun. So that slit can be bent It's like by the... the like the double slit experiment. I think it's inter interference. So like... You're telling me you're telling me that a solar eclipse can basically create interferometry on the ground is what you're saying. It you, what all you're saying is that there's shadows that look like snakes, right? Correct. I'm saying I think that has some it's like interferometry. I've done that with lasers. It could be. When does it happen? Just before C2? Just before C2 and just after C3 when the sun is a slit. It has to be that final little narrow slit. Otherwise, it doesn't work. How long does it last? For about 20 or 30 seconds. You, you have to catch it. So you have to know it's about to happen. Exactly. So it happens just before C2 and just after C3? Correct. Okay. Now, in my program, I have the announcement at three minutes before totality. I know that's too early. But I didn't want a lot of gabbing bef two minutes before totality because I wanted people to get ready for photography. So it's a little early for the announcement, but you have to look for them about 60 seconds before totality. The other thing is they are very faint shadows. So if you're set up on a black parking lot, you're not going to see it. If you're set up on a very dark um, green field, you may not see it. You need a little contrast. Uh, we saw them the second time in Africa because we were set up on the side of a road basically on very light colored dirt. When I set up for an eclipse on land, I set up on a king size flat white sheet to look for shadow bands because you need that contrast. This eclipse, I'm actually going to try to set up a photography, a video experiment. Some of what I know about shadow bands is, and I'll send it to you, is from an email of this guy in NASA who has studied it. And we want, I want to set up a white sheet with a video camera at what I think is going to be the proper exposure because I don't want the camera to adjust for the lighting. Yeah. And I'm going to set it up in a certain direction. I don't know what direction. And I'm going to have gray pieces of paper on it, um, little lines to kind of adjust my, um, my contrast. And I'm going to let it run from about five minutes before totality and about five minutes after and try to catch shadow bands. There's very few videos, good videos, of shadow bands on the internet. They're hard to catch. But they exist. They do. It's wonderful to see them. Ha. Wow, man, this is cool. I'm going to try that. I'm going to set up a camera just for shadow bands. Yeah. Now that I actually know that shadow bands are a thing. And there's not good videos on the internet. Very few. Very After this video, there will be videos of shadow bands if they exist. Should they exist at, on every single... They may not exist for every eclipse, and they may not exist in your observation area. Okay. They don't always happen. I rarely ask people to do things on Smarter Everyday videos, but we have to catch video of shadow bands. That has to happen. I think it's interferometry. I'm not sure. We'll so the way to do out. it is set up a video camera on a man manual exposure on a king-size white sheet. Or like light concrete or, or something like that. Or light concrete, yeah. Hmm. Or the side of a, um, a light colored house. I've, I've seen a little bit of video of that. Okay. Side of a white colored car. I've seen a little bit of video of that. But all of them are not very contrasty. They're not very clear. We have to get better ones. Okay.
That'll happen. Okay, got it. Cool. Yeah. All right, so here's my second eclipse. So this is in Zimbabwe. This is when we saw shadow bands. We went to Zimbabwe for a minute and 23 seconds. Wait, one, one second. How, how long do the shadow bands last? About 20 or 30 seconds. They're very quick because it's only at that little slit. And yeah. you remember, this is happening right before totality. Okay. And, and this NASA scientist thinks it's because of the bending of the light on the side of the umbra because the umbra in the atmosphere is going to be cooler than the penumbra right next to it. Okay. So he thinks that's what causes it. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So here's uh, how you choose an eclipse, a location for observing an eclipse. The first thing is weather. The second thing is weather. <laughs> and the third thing is weather. <laughs> <laughs> then it's totality duration. Then accessibility and safety along the location, especially if you're traveling to foreign countries. That's why this American eclipse is so wonderful. I mean, the whole place is safe. The whole place is easy to get to, right? The cost to travel costs a lot of money to go to these overseas. To be able to drive to one in the States. Lodging at the eclipse, much easier in the United States than if you're going far away, although all the hotel rooms in the path are already booked. Access to supplies, food and water. Restroom facilities. Remember, this whole eclipse takes about three hours from C1 to C4, and you're going to set up an hour before, and then you got to break down. So if you're if you're guiding a group to this, you have to make sure there's bathroom facilities or not. And it's nice to have electricity at the observing site if you can, but most of our gear runs on batteries. So those are our spots, and uh, I'm just and so the other thing I did was I did this on purpose. Because I want my spots to be about 350 miles apart because of the way the weather systems run through the southeast, right? Because, you know, generally a weather system will clear out in about 10 hours, basically. So I'm going to be following this um, weather uh, site in telecast because what I like about it is it puts the fronts, mm -hmm. infrared, and the radar all on one picture. And then it predicts how the fronts are going to move. So... On Saturday, we will look at the fronts moving through and decide if we have to go east to be in front of something coming or drive through a front to get on the west side of something coming through. Okay. So then just honing in, so here's our Sweetwater site. I have 14 hotel rooms rented between or reserved between this Holiday Inn and this Motel 6. Are you just going to cancel them the day before? Luckily, these are cancel a bowl. Now, some people in the path, hotels in the path, are making you pay in advance, and they're non-refundable. Mm -hmm. When I booked these, I did not have to pay in advance, and they are still refundable unless they change the rules. There's other hotels in the path that are canceling people's previous um, re reservations and tell them it just got lost, mm -hmm. and they're... And, and they're, they're Wow. Increasing the prices by three or four times for the Eclipse. Wow. That may happen to me. I mean, I don't know. So you're about to teach us about equipment? Yeah. In my talk about photographing an Eclipse, what I tell people to do is to try to pull everything they have out of their closet right now and try to make it work. Don't start to shop for expensive photography equipment. Because a lot of people have a little SLR camera, even a point and shoot. They already have a video camera. And these things are usable. Sometimes the only thing you have to buy is maybe a, a 90 degree eyepiece so you can see better. This eclipse is high in the sky. You know, at Hopkinsville it's 62 degrees in the sky. It's going to be hard to get underneath a camera to look up and focus unless you have, you know, a movable LCD screen and not everybody does. So if you don't, a 90 degree eyepiece is good. You need a remote shutter release. A lot of people might not have that. And you'll have to get solar filters. But a lot of people are going to have a lot of gear that they can just use. So the, these are solar filters here? Yeah. So what, what types of solar filters are these? So that's called a beta, a beta filter. It's B-A-D-D-E-R. It's, um, it's a film that has metal on it. That's called a glass filter. That's a metalized glass filter. Uh, that's the kind that I use. The beta, the beta filter will give a white sun image when you look at it, the, the other one. Yeah. That glass filter will give a yellow sun, sun image. And this, white, yellow, okay. And this is called black polymer. These are, that's a binocular system that I, I made. Uh -huh. That's black polymer, and that'll give a yellow sun image. All of those are good for photography of the partial phases. But you take all of them off for totality. You do not need a filter for totality because totality 
is 100,000 times less bright than the photosphere of the sun. So you take those pictures without a filter. Mm. You can also use number 14 welder's glass, but that's not good for photography. It's not opti good enough optical quality, and it looks green. So I need to look for a baiter, spader. So right now, I need to look for a baiter, I can't, can't say that right. Bader filter, B-A-D-D-E-R. It is a bader. Mm -hmm. Bader filter. Bader filter, okay. Right. I thought. Or okay. metallized glass. Okay. My preference is metallized glass. You'll see this filter. This filter is actually already pretty new. I have another one that's like this that already has a nick in it from, feel how thin that is. I mean, that's basically like tin foil under tension. Yeah. So I like glass. Okay. And how much should I expect to pay for that? Depending on the diameter of that pre-made glass filter, between forty and eighty dollars. All right, cool. So I'll put some links in the video description to places where you can get some filters. And Thousand Oaks Optical is what I recommend. Oh yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Okay, sweet. Now this is key, um, Dustin, and this is what I teach in my photography course about eclipses. The sun is small in the sky. And to get reasonable pictures of the corona, you need a little bit of a telephoto lens. So you can see 200 millimeters. This is, these are my eclipse pictures photoshopped into um, scans of film. So you get a relative idea of the size. So you can't really do it with a 100 millimeter fil um, you know, lens that you have at home because that's just going to be too small. And you can see as you get the focal lengths a little bit further, you start to get more and more um, definition in your totality pictures and, and the corona. The sweet spot is about 800 millimeters to about 1100 or 1200 millimeters. I'm going to be shooting one set at 1000 millimeters right here and another setup at 905 millimeters. Because you can see when you get up too tight, you start to cut out the outer filaments of the corona on the long exposure. Ah, so at 1,000 millimeters, you're able to get the corona, depending on the crop of your sensor, you're able to get the corona but not cut it off on the edges. That's exactly right. This is effective focal length. So this is taking your crop of, of a small chip camera into consideration. You have to test this ahead of time. You have to know what your camera's gonna do. You gotta look at your images on the computer and make sure you have about two diameters of sun room all the way around your sun. And you take these pictures now, I'm gonna show you another slide, with a solar filter on your sun and make sure you have room around your sun right now. So you determine this size now so you know you have room for corona later. Got it. And you do it with a solar filter now. So you can practice this now. You can get your gear ready now in terms of focal length. What you can't practice is exposures because you have to have a solar filter on right now. Got it. Got it. And so here's just... This is one of my little tricks for teaching people how to get some starting shutter speeds. When you go out with your gear now, you want to expose for a nice yellow sun. With this setup, this was the 1000 millimeter setup, I was running an f12.6 slide film of 200. So those two are fixed. You can't change that. Eclipse photography is all about shutter speed because two of your three variables are fixed, okay? When you determine with your setup what a nice yellow sun disk image exposure is, that is going to be an exposure that is going to be pretty good for inner corona. So it gets you in the range. You about know where you need to be. Because in the corona, during totality, you're going to decrease your shutter speeds more and more and more to get more exposure. There's not one exposure that can give you the full dynamic range of a totality. But this gets you started. So here's a full corona picture, right? So this is 1,000 millimeters, 12.6, ISO 200 at a half a second. And that is a, a pretty nicely exposed corona. Now, there's a little formula that Fred Espinek publishes for how long you can have a shutter speed if you're not on a telescope motorized mount, if you're just on a camera mount, before the movement of the Earth will blur your picture. 
His formula is 340 divided by your focal length, okay? So for my system, his formula would say that I can only really get away with a third of a second before earth motion blur, but I really got away with about a half a second. So it's kind of rough, but you need to go by that formula. I mean, Fred Espinick's the man, so that's what we go by. Now, if you are on a motorized mount, where your camera is tracking the sun, you don't have to worry, you're gonna compensate for the earth rotation, so you can decrease your ISOs and increase your shutter speeds. So you're, you shoot everything, let me just say it again for audio, so you shoot everything manually. Correct. So you don't, basically you set, let me try that one more time for audio, so you set your camera up in manual mode. Correct. And, and why do you not auto expose with the, with the camera itself? The dynamic range of totality is so great that you don't know if your camera is going to know what to do with it, what to expose for. You can't center meter on the sun, it's going to be dark. Oh. You can't matrix meter on the whole scene, it, will not know, it won't know what to do. So there's so much contrast in that shot because you have dark, light, dark. Yes your camera doesn't know what to do. So you have to, you don't have to, but it's very advisable to shoot in manual mode. Exactly. Wow. So okay. you want to, you want to set everything I up manual. messed that up. You want to set everything up manual mode and you want to bracket shutter speeds. Now, new digital cameras have a lot of auto bracketing. So if you can set up one shutter click to take your normal exposure and two above and two below, that's fine. If your camera will do it, set it up. But you have to do it manual. Here's the other thing. That's smart. I, I would have, I would have do You this don't up. know what your yeah. camera's gonna do and you can't practice for it. There's no way to practice for how your camera is gonna know what to do with the dynamic range of totality. And, and again, it's just because it's dark in the middle. It's like, even right now, my camera is having a hard time dealing with that image. That's interesting. It's, it's because it's dark in the middle, there's this huge white band and it's dark on the outside and your camera just doesn't know how to auto expose for that. That's exactly right. Interesting. And the interesting. other thing is you want to use manual focus. You, your camera will also not know how to focus when you go between the partial phases and then totality. So you basically want to focus on infinity, but infinity is not always perfect depending on what lenses you're using. So we have to hope we have sunspots on the day of the eclipse. The sun has been very quiet lately. It's not a lot of sunspots, but sunspots are very helpful to get crisp focus because it's really hard to just focus on the outer limb of the sun. Gotcha. Gotcha. So manual focus, manual mode, your F stop will be fixed. You'll choose your ISO ahead of time, it will be fixed. You will only adjust your shutter speed. Had I not heard this today, I would have messed that up. No question. That makes sense. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. All right, so I think, all right, so here, look at this. These are um, a thousand seconds. This is during totality but you see a thousandth of a second. You see that the exposure is so fast that you're not exposing any of the corona and you're actually seeing the red chromosphere of the sun because the moon Did is you take blocking, this? Yeah, the moon is blocking this photosphere. Now here is... What, what, what is the red bands? That's chromosphere. What is chromosphere? It's like the second layer down in the sun. Really? Huh. So here, let me go back to this. So this is, my, this is what I do in my photography talk. You know if your yellow sun disk image is a 60th of a second, that you're going to be at a 60th of a second, you're going to get some inner corona. But you see how the white in the corona is starting to blanch out the chromosphere. It's back there, but you can't see it. In this long duration, the inner corona is, is overexposed to get the filaments of the outer corona. That's why no one sun exposure gets the whole dynamic range of totality. You have to bracket, you see? Yep. So you have to bracket over maybe 10 stops to get it all. But so I was at a 60th of a second for yellow sun disk image. We know a 60th of a second was good for inner corona. So look how many stops up I had to be to get rid of corona 
to C chromosphere. One, two, three, four stops by the old stop method, not in between electric stops. Okay. Right? So you have to understand camera stops, you know, the relationship between focal length, ISO, and shutter speed in the old wheel stops. Got it. And so if you do it right and you know um, some timing, you can put together a sequence like this, which is first contact all the way to totality, and then the partial phases after way, afterwards all the way to the fourth contact. And this is yours? This is mine. You proud of this one? Absolutely. My inspiration for being able to do this was, you know, one of the greatest photographers for solo eclipses is, is Fred Espinick. And he's published a lot of these. And I definitely wanted to be able to pull it off, and I did it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So do you have this printed out and mounted in your house somewhere? Yeah. That's yeah. neat. Yeah. Just to summarize what I just learned in this room, okay? So obviously timing's important, weather's important. You know, all the things I wanted to photograph. Things I need to look for are ambient temperature changing around me. Absolutely. It's you a, will feel it dropping. A 360 degree sunset is what it's going to feel like. During totality, right. look at yourself in the center of the shadow. Look at the look at the horizon all the way around. Bailey's beads is a way I can see the moon cutting across the sun. I can tell that it's not a, a smooth sphere. Right, because the sun will be coming through the last little bit of mountains and valleys of the side of the surface of the moon. The diamond ring is the neat photo that happens as you're moving towards C3, and then your contact C2 times. C2 or C3, the right. diamond ring happens both ways. It's diamond ring, Bailey's beads going in, it's Bailey's beads, diamond ring going out. And then, so we got C1, C2, C3, C4, and I really need to know when those are going to happen, right. and that tells me how to photograph and how to observe and all that good stuff. Exactly. So that's the heart of how to scientifically view this eclipse, right? That's the heart of it. I would say enjoy this eclipse. Enjoy this eclipse. Okay, got it. Awesome.